Hello gardeners, thank you for joining us. This is Mid-American Gardener and I'm Diane Nolan, your host. And since I like to talk about perennials and even cut flowers, that's my area of expertise, but wow, we can talk about spring finally. And I see some folks here who would be very good at talking about all kinds of things having to do with spring weather. So let's find out who's here and you can direct your questions towards their expertise if you would please. And I thank you in advance. Let's go first to Doug Williams. Hi there, or should I say Dr. Doug Williams? Hello. You're first. Thank you, uh, Diane. I'm Doug Williams and I am a PhD in landscape architecture. So I will be answering your questions about uh, landscape design as well as some general horticultural questions as well. I'm intrigued about what you've brought. What are you going to well, talk I about? I brought a show and tell, and it, this is a season for a lot of different things, but any season, and all seasons have interest in a lot of plant material. Um, so I decided to bring a few things uh, to do some arranging. Uh, one of the things I like is to have a nice container. These are, this is ceramic, and uh, it can be used to hold candy or other items in the house when you don't have an arrangement. But when you do, you can go ahead and um, fill it with water as you like, and you can arrange in it. So one thing I like about um, something I found a couple years ago when I started doing Japanese flower arranging, and this is called, the, called a Kenzan, K-E-N-Z-A-N, um, uh, uh, Kenzan. So these are very heavy, um, almost like a pin cushion. So that can be set in the water uh, just below the level so that the plant material can touch the water. So right now, if you're outside and you happen to have a yucca plant, you can take that and stick it down into your Kenzan after doing some proper pruning. And you can have that arranged in such a way that you like. Other plants that you're pruning where you have cross branching and alike, you can begin to arrange with that. This is some uh, magnolia. I don't know if this is star. It looks like star. Star yeah. magnolia. And Ooh, and then we also beautiful. have some Cornelian cherry, which is a uh, uh, dogwood. And let's see if I can arrange backwards without even looking. It's looking good. I like the cooking shows. <laughs> let's just Bring see. one out of the oven. <laughs> and my professors are laughing. So this is not how I taught you to do this. You can have it be Western line, and, and I think it looks just great. <laughs> and so this is uh, influenced by Japanese uh, flower arranging or uh, ikebana. Uh, and it would be more so in the freestyle because I haven't really followed some of the um, more formal principles, but the odd numbers and then the arranging from one particular angle uh, for viewing. And so in the springtime you can, um, or even in the fall or any season, if you're cutting dogwoods of various kind, red twig, um, I've cut um, flowering dogwood once and used it in a pond arrangement. People thought it was a water plant, and it is not. Um, but it was nice to fool them and to uh, have them uh, interest in, interested in that landscape uh, plant as, um, as an element to incorporate at some point in time. So that's what I brought for show and tell and enjoy. It is beautiful and, and you're just borrowing things from the tree that you would need to prune eventually anyway. That's nice and the star magnolia is going to start making it very fragrant here. I just know it. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Well, now let's go next to you, Nancy Paddocky. I'm Nancy Paddocky and uh, I'm a plant pathologist. My specialty has been diagnostics. I was at the plant clinic at the University of Illinois for uh, a number of years, over 30. And I have a, a question that was sent in by uh, Karen and it says, hi, I've been wondering lately about some trees having that have suckers that grow from the base of the trunk and others do not, so other trees don't have the suckers. Uh, we have some trees that continuously grow these suckers while other trees have never had them. Does it have to do with the depth the tree was planted and how can I get rid of suckers for, for good from the trees that have them? Um, there are quite a few trees, pretty, pretty common trees and shrubs that have suckers, have these extra shoots at the base of them. Um, one a couple that you might be familiar with are ones like Rhodosia dogwood. Um, there's forsythia, lilacs do it. We've got a service berry in our area that's just crazy with the suckers. But there's, there's a lot of them that do that. And it's every place I've looked, I can't find any reason for one species having it over another. It's just some species do and some don't. There isn't, there's, you know, other than injuring a tree or a shrub, there's really nothing that you've done that's a cause that to happen. And I really doubt that planting too deep would cause a suckering, because usually suckering is more common on shallow roots. So I don't think it has anything to do with deep, deep planting. Um, 
As far as getting, you want to get rid of the suckers if you can, and then you should get rid of them as soon as possible because they're just going to pull energy out of the rest of the plant, plus they don't look very nice. Um, one way you can do it is you can prune the suckers off, but it's really better if you can actually snap them off, pull them off, especially in the spring, uh, because that takes those adventitious buds off the base of the plant as well so that they aren't as, they don't come back as quickly. They're still going to come back. You can't get rid of them forever. Um, some people like to use chemicals, and one thing I would warn you against is don't use glyphosate, that's Roundup, because if you make a cut and you spray that on, the, the suckers coming out of the base of the tree, it'll get absorbed up into the tree and it can cause some really nasty splitting and cankering and all that on the tree. Mm -hmm. So I'd really stay away from that if you can. But a lot of garden centers have products that have NAA in them, and those are plant hormones, and it's best if you could either pull off the suckers or cut them off and then spray them with this stuff. And it'll keep the suckers out for a good three months, but they will come back. <laughs> but that'll, that's the best way we've been able to control them. They will come yeah. back, but just be vigilant. Yep, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, that was a good discussion of suckers. Okay, now let's go to you, Larry Shobe. I'm Larry Shobe and I was the former grounds gardener for Eastern Illinois University. And uh, my experiences in gardening began when I was very young. And so I work uh, basically with flowers, shrubs, trees, and vines and uh, all my life. And so I wanted to talk to you this evening about snowdrops. They are the first bulb that blooms in the spring. And yet I don't see all that many of them. And they're very beautiful. They're very easy to take care of. Uh, they will bl uh, be starting blooming most years in late January and the snow may come and cover them up and when it eventually melts they're still in bloom and they last for quite a while. It's really something that's nice about them. And the other thing is you never have to really worry about it seems like digging them up and separating them because they're not blooming. Uh, they, they bloom in mass for years and years, every little bulb, regardless of the size of the circle. Now, daffodils and tulips won't do that, but they will. And so, uh, the only thing you want to make sure that you don't mow them off before uh, June when they're dying down. Once they turn yellow, the leaves turn yellow, you can mow them off. But, and that's true of all of your bulbs, uh, tulips, daffodils, and snowdrops and some others uh, die down in June. So don't mow, mow them off because the bulb for the next year is building up that energy to flower real good. Yeah. Oh, snowdrops are great. Thank you yes. for talking about those. Mine hopscotched, well, self-sewed across the sidewalk. And so yeah. now they're starting to spread through some English ivy that's and just contained. I love it. Take them up and love put it. one bulb in a place in a few years, you've got mm -hmm. wonderful, a wonderful collection of them in whatever design you want. It's great, so thank you for that. Yeah. Well, we wanna go next to a Did You Know? Let's see what we've got for today. Monarch butterflies smell with their antennas. They use their compound eyes to locate flowers and then their antenna to smell the nectar. And finally, they taste the flower with the bottoms of their feet. Special receptors on the ends of their feet called tarsi taste sweet liquids. Okay, so now we're gonna go to the phone lines and we wanna start first with Janet and she's on line one with a question about grass. Hi there, Janet. Hi. We have an asparagus patch and of course the grass is starting to come up before the asparagus is. However, I'm wondering if there's anything we can put on the grass to kill it without harming the asparagus. Well, I happened to be in a uh, local store, I'm trying to not mention names, and I was chatting with a really nice viewer of our show, and he said there is a product called Grass Off, and I have not used it. I use the weeding by hand method, um, but if you, you've got to make sure, if you find a product, it has to be, you, be able to be used on asparagus. So I have not used that product, has anyone? used it for asparagus? No, but what uh, you can use for grasses to kill grasses uh, will uh, not kill the broadleaf, I know that. Right. 
So. Uh, but we're talking about an edible crop, so you have, they and have it's to be edible. really careful to you eat have, that label. That's and, true. And with it being right now before they start to come up, it, this is such a good time to work the soil with weeds. I mean, it's easier to get the weeds out now yeah, than true. any other time of the year. So um, I'd avoid the chemicals. I would. Uh, that's but that viewer told me about it, and he says he works. Uh, it worked for him, but not at this time of the year. I think. So, so I'm being a little bit hesitant and about. And it may be. Uh, I've not used it. That asparagus grows real thick, and that grass, if it's quack grass, it sends runners out and comes up in them, and so. Uh, if it'll work, that'd be great because uh, it's the only way you could get it. Mm -hmm. so. so anyway, a little bit of a caveat, so be careful and do read any instructions to make sure it's good with asparagus. Thank you, Janet, for that question, and we want to move along to a strawberry question on line two, and this is Virginia. Hi there, Virginia. Hello. I was at a, a local store and picked up some strawberry plants. I was wondering if it's too early to put them out. Well, first off, I'm going to say, is your soil workable? If you're um, a, if you're able to it's work, a raised garden with with, uh, so it's never been packed down, so it's usually workable pretty early. Oh, raised gardens, yeah, yeah. that's excellent. My strawberries look pretty good, but as long as your soil is workable, if you're not sure about it, you could always put a covering over it for the first, you know, an evening or two that might have a, a danger of frost, but. I would put them out. Mm -hmm. Yes, they'll get a head start, and, and if your soil's fine, that that's great. Just go ahead and plant them now. For most people, it's the limitation of the soil. Right. But I do if grow the in. Too wet, it'll be cloddy. Right. I grow in raised beds and wide rows, so I've got my onions going, and yes. I have turnips up and radishes, so raised beds make a big difference. Okay, thank you very much for your question. Now we have a pear question uh, from Joe, and this is line three. Hi there, Joe. Hello there. A year or so ago, I bought a pear tree, and I was told that I need to buy two for that boy-girl thing. And recently, <laughs> I heard the same concept for tomato plants, that you should get two of the same variety. And I just... It's not an April Fool's joke, I don't think. <laughs> but I'm curious to hear your reaction. Okay. Let's start with Nancy. She's... Well, I don't, I don't think in tomatoes it makes any difference. I, I've, for years, just picked out... I don't like a lot of tomatoes, so I just get, you know, like a cherry tomato and a, and a large tomato and plant, and that's all I use. And I still get plenty of fruit, so it might be an April Fool's thing. <laughs> uh, now, with pears, I have seen that. But uh, I know the um, where I grew up, we have one pear, and it is one pear tree, and it is loaded every year. So does anyone and no other pears near it? There were originally, but I've seen old pears. Old pears. Yes, and I just think one tree standing in the, in the countryside alone. And, and I think no it was a Bartlett. Probably. So was. Some of the newer pears, you you would definitely want to follow. The boy girl. Yeah. <laughs> yes, some of those, and the really interesting, the Bosque pair, I mean, you might want to check those out, but I've seen old ones, just a single one. But any place you go and any uh, mail order would be specific about it, so read up on it. Okay, thank you for that. Now we're going to uh, go to a question or a comment about Roundup, and it's on line four. Hello there, Dick. What is your question or comment? Well, my question is... Uh Occasionally you talk about using Roundup to uh, control weeds, and I think I read an article in the paper this week that talked about uh, Roundup it being a possible carcinian, carcinian, and I just wanted to see uh, what uh, your thoughts are. Um, we had a, a comment about it a couple of weeks ago. Someone said thought it had dioxin in it. Uh, Roundup has dioxane, D-I-O-X-A-N-E, and there is... Um, some information several of my colleagues sent it that there is a possible link to it being a carcinogen and it's is this overly surprising I mean no. uh, when you think about it you need to use any kind of chemical in a very responsible way know what it's labeled for and so there is um, the dioxane and several of my colleagues have um, 
sent me these links about it, but it's not dioxin. It is not that. So um, yes, I have been seeing that and reading several of the articles. So use things with tremendous caution, gloves, uh, safety precautions, not using it too often or using it when you need to. Uh, any of you jump in if you wish to, but that's what I have been getting some of the reports as uh, maybe reading the same article. Cultivating your weeds early in the spring as they come up is, is the best thing that you can do to put an end to the majority of the weeds. You're always going to have some weeds growing in under some foliage or up close to a stem that you may have to pull, but if you'll just take a rake every week through your soil until the plant shades it out, that helps enormously. I've learned that from experience. Yeah, I think trying to go as chemical free as possible. I use very little I chemicals. I do too, and I, 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 I don't as well. I do too, not yeah. use very <laughs> Don't want to. Yeah. Some I things you have to, bagworms yeah. and things. So everything comes with a risk, so do be careful. Thank you, Dick, for that comment. I appreciate that. All right, we're going to go back to our panelists, and I'm going to ask Doug to see what he's got for us next. Well, one of our viewers uh, contacted us and asked us about their raised bed, and they say they have a 12 by 8 foot raised bed uh, in the front of their home. Um, it's packed with decent uh, curb appeal, they mentioned. Uh, they currently have a uh, hostas, which is a very large uh, species of plants uh, or of a particular species, and it has uh, mostly perennials in it. Uh, and they want to know about grasses, in particular tall grasses, um, taller plants and not day lilies in particular. I guess they see them quite often, and so they may be um, overwhelmed by that. Um, even small bush-like shrubs could also be of a nice appeal for this garden. And so some things I would recommend, um, miscanthus um, is a grass, which is nice. They have some variegated kind, uh, striped, uh, maybe in red, red tinged. Um, to give some type of foliage color. Um, even the seed heads are attractive as well as the leaves um, when they have um, the movement with the breeze or the climate that's there. Um, other shrubs, um, you can almost pick from a variety. Uh, they are spireas, smaller, shorter ones, they are taller ones. Um, they have interesting foliage as well as flowers. And I'd also mention even um, some that don't flower but have, oh, well, they do flower, but the flowers aren't as showy, but they have some very interesting fall color, and that's a uh, roos, um, or fragrant sumac in particular. So that would be something that would be nice to have in this um, smaller bed. It's not as large as it seems, so I wouldn't place any more than, say, five or maybe even seven plants in this space because that will pretty much fill in the space over time, too. So, And you might want to have something like a liriope, which is a um, shorter grass-like plant um, that you would only have to mow maybe uh, early spring to cutting off the older foliage so that the green shows through for the remainder of the season. So those are some plants you can experiment with and then f pick from a variety of other plants that you may have an interest in. Read about them first and then make sure this is the right condition for um, what appears to possibly be a full sun location. So I don't know if hostas are the best choice, but if they're doing well, go ahead and stick with it. It's not broken. <laughs> so <laughs> don't fix it. Yet. Don't with fix the liriope, it. there's uh, spreading varieties too, so mm -hmm. you need to be careful and not get that if you don't want it to spread into everything. Mm -hmm. And with a raised bed, that probably would mm -hmm. stop the you know, check the growth as long as it didn't It'll go. take over the bed though. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, good discussion for raised beds. We've had that come up several times today. All right, Nancy, what have you got for us? Oh, I, I have another question from a viewer, and this one it's a, it's a it's a little difficult to answer, um, but 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 that we're going to use that as an example of of what maybe you can do in the future if you have questions. It says I have marigolds that produce hundreds of flower pods, but they do not open. Why? Thanks, Mike. Well, I don't know if it's just me, but um, there's flower buds. And there's seed pods. So when you when you say that there's flower pods, I'm not sure which one you're referring to. So I'm going to take it both ways. But um, the the image is, if you could send an image when you have questions like this, that that would help us tremendously. Um, the image that you're seeing is not from the viewer, but um, what we, we would if we could see it, we you know that would help us a lot. But 
let's say, uh, he, first of all, he's talking about seed pods, and that, them not opening up would be fairly normal. Uh, the seed pods on a, on a marigold are actually at the base of the flower, so it's like the petals all dry up, and then the, po the seeds are in, underneath that, and you can just pull them out. But I, I don't think that that's what he meant. I think he's talking about the flower buds not opening, and there's lots of reasons for that. And I think if we saw pictures, it might help us a lot uh, answering that because marigolds are pretty easy to grow, and there's, there's just lots of different variations that could cause this. But first of all, if they're just shriveling up, maybe the plants are just getting too dry, too hot, especially if they're in a container or even in a raised bed or, you mm -hmm. know, whatever. Um, or they could be pot-bound, again, if they're in a container that, that you know, that the but it would be, seem really odd that just the flowers were shriveling up and nothing else was shriveling. So I'd like to kind of know what the foliage looks like too. Um, if it's just the buds, it could be botrytis, which is a fungal disease. Um, but if you, got, if you get botrytis, you're gonna, they're gonna be kind of fluffy and um, kind of gray looking, but you'd also probably see problems on the foliage. Um, there's also another disease called aster yellows that could be, and aster yellows will cause it's not so much the buds don't open, but they, they just look like leafy structures. Instead of a nice flower, they look kind of like... More vegetative. More vegetative kind of growth. You can tell that was supposed to be a flower. Um, and that's a, a disease, it's a phytoplasma that's spread by leaf hoppers and by aphids. Um, and if, that, if the plant had that, then I would recommend that you just take it out. And actually, it leaves, or some of the, the buds could even be deformed by some insects. A tarnished plant bug can cause that. So there's so many different things that it could be. And so when you have questions, if you could try to send a picture along and maybe talk a little bit about the other plant parts, we could probably help better. But those are some possibilities you could look into anyway. That was a thorough discussion of why flowers well, are not you guys open. That was have any that other ideas? Good. I don't oh, know. Oh, my, yeah, no, that was very well thorough. Covered it. Okay. Very good. Thank Sorry you. Sorry I couldn't tell you exactly, though. But a good image is helpful, mm -hmm. Very and so much, you're yeah. welcome to send that in digitally, or you know, as well as um, you know through the mail. Also, thank you. Now, what have you got for us, Larry? Uh, Badalia, I've been getting quite a number of uh, questions about how far back Badalia should be pruned this year, due to our cold winter that we have had. Uh, Budlia doesn't take that very well. And so most of them, I think you will find, have died even the heavy stems back to the ground. And they're already, in Charleston at least, uh, they're beginning to send out new growth at the base of them. Sometimes you can tell the bark begins to peel away, especially from the smaller stems. But um, they, they've been hurt terribly this year, so you want to take them to the ground. But there's other years that we have mild winters, and you want to wait and see just how long it takes for them to bud out, because some years I just deadhead mine in the spring, and that's all, that's all it takes. But this year is a different story with Bedlia. Uh, one thing that you can do that'll help you save your bushes, because sometimes it does kill them, when they freeze clear to the ground, is to layer other branches down, and we'll talk about that later this evening, so that you have more than one root system on those plants, and uh, they generally don't all die at the same time if you've got two or three right there in a cluster uh, growing. Well, I um, removed my Budlia down to the ground just yesterday, and it was there was I nothing <laughs> alive about it. Uh, occasionally I'll do that and use it for pea steaks. Uh, <laughs> but it might still shoot up, so don't, don't from, kill From it. the roots, yeah, yes. I, think, I think it yeah, might. Mine's dead to the ground, too. Yeah, and some years, like you were saying, I will not get it done, and every, every node will branch. <laughs> and, and then, then it's hard to cut them then out. Then it's seven feet tall, <laughs> and dead ones. that's not the idea, because <laughs> yeah. it wasn't in a place where it should be seven feet mm. tall. Well, let's uh, sh talk a little bit about grass seed and go to the mag quiz. Spring is the best time to plant grass. What temperature do grass seeds germinate? A, 95 degrees, B, 65 degrees, C, 85 degrees. B, 65 degrees. Seed your lawn when the spring days warm up to 65 degrees. Water regularly to maintain soil moisture. I wish spring were three months long. 
It's just not a long <laughs> enough season <laughs> for me. It goes from winter enough. and then it seems like there's an occasional summer mixed in and then back to spring. But I do enjoy spring. I wanted to uh, show you these beautiful flowers and I wanted to thank the uh, State Florist Association for their uh, Hall of Fame recognition for me for this year. And I'm really um, honored and they just gave me really very pretty flowers. So here's the Hall of Fame flowers from the State Florist Convention. Thank you, I appreciate the honor. Well, we have a really fast show. It seems <laughs> like there's so much to talk about and we have great knowledgeable viewers. So I wanna thank each one of you for being here today because it was really very interesting. So hopefully each one of you will get out there and garden because there are lots of things to do, deadheading, raking, whatever it might be, planting. That's what I like to do. <laughs> so we hope that you have a great week gardening. See you next time. Goodbye.